I'm Barbara Messing, director of the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. We've created this video as a tutorial on rigid and flexible stroboscopy. Dr. Simon Best is a fellowship trained laryngologist who's going to be teaching the tips and tricks that he uses in the practice to get the best image when he's doing a rigid or flexible stroboscopy examination. There are two methods to examine the vocal cords, rigid stroboscopy and flexible stroboscopy. There's a difference in how you perform them and a difference in why we do them. I'm a big believer in the anatomic accuracy and high quality video of rigid stroboscopy. The light source is better, the image is sharper, and you're able to get a very accurate assessment of the medial edge of the vocal cords and their vibrations in order to accurately assess vocal cord pathology. It's important when you're doing rigid stroboscopy to have a finely focused exam because you'll be able to see pathology on the vocal cord edges that is actually difficult sometimes to even see with flexible stroboscopy. With rigid stroboscopy you're able to see the detail of the uh, anatomy of the vocal cords in a highly accurate way and when you're doing the exam you want to make sure that you focus on bringing out that element of the vocal pathology typically by having the patients go to high and soft pitch to stretch out the vocal cords and allow them to thin out in order to be able to see the medial edge. The benefit of flexible laryngoscopy which is the other main examination of the vocal cords of course is the ability to have running speech with rigid stroboscopy, all we can essentially evaluate is the vocal cord vibration on a sustained vowel E, both low pitch and high pitch as well as glide. With flexible laryngoscopy, we can often get an assessment of the evaluation of speech tasks. Often muscle tension dysphonia manifests itself in running speech in a way that it wouldn't necessarily on a sustained phonation. And disorders like paradoxical vocal cord motion, or spasmodic dysphonia are much easier to see with a flexible examination. In addition, of course, flexible laryngoscopy allows for a full evaluation of the entire upper aerodigestive tract. Examination of the velopharynx, the base of tongue, the hypopharynx, the postcricoid region. So if there's a suspicion for tumors or other findings in the aerodigestive tract, flexible laryngoscopy or video strobolaryngoscopy is the, is the examination of choice. In my practice, I typically perform rigid stroboscopy if patients are presenting with purely a dysphonic complaint, alternation of the voice or a suspicion for a vocal cord uh, paralysis because I typically perform my vocal cord injections with a transoral technique. If patients have voice complaints, consistent with spasmodic dysphonia or muscle tension dysphonia or swallowing disorders, chronic cough or other concerns uh, of a similar nature, then flexible video strobolaryngoscopy allows for anatomic evaluation as well as examination of vocal cord vibration. There are a couple technical reasons why I prefer the accuracy of rigid stroboscopy. The first is that there's a barrel distortion effect from flexible laryngoscopy with a fish eye mounted on the end of the camera that creates a curvature of the image. This effect can be seen if you examine just a straight lines or a grid with a rigid stroboscope or a flexible laryngoscope. The light source for rigid stroboscopy also tends to be more evenly distributed and brighter across the full range of the image. In photography terms it's called vignetting where there's a fall off of light from a single point source in the center of the image to darkened images at the periphery. And that effect happens with flexible laryngoscope. The final distortion that happens with flexible laryngoscopy is actually a foreshortening effect of the vocal cords because of the angle at which the laryngoscope is evaluating the vocal cords. So these three reasons create a more accurate anatomic picture of the vocal cord anatomy with rigid stroboscopy. All right, so what we're going to do now is rigid laryngoscopy or rigid stroboscopy, where we're going to use a 70 degree telescope to take a look at the vocal cords um, in order to evaluate laryngeal function and vibration. So there are a number of critical things about doing rigid stroboscopy. Most people can actually tolerate it very well, and in fact it's not painful at all because of the fact that there's nothing sensitive in the oral cavity that's going to cause any discomfort, but you have to overcome the gag reflex. That's the main thing that we're trying to overcome 
from a technical point of view in order to get a good image on a rigid stroboscopy. A critical portion, therefore, of the procedure is actually taking the time in order to appropriately anesthetize the tongue and the palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall in order to get a good exam. So what we're going to do now is I'll show you the techniques that I use in order to spray the tongue and the oral cavity. I use benzocaine, which is 20% benzocaine, which is a topical anesthetic that we're going to apply directly first to the base of the tongue. So what we want to have the patient do, and this is a critically important position for the entire procedure, is the leaning forward, chin up and out position, like you're sticking your neck out like a turtle sticking their, their head out of their shell. And what this does is it, it extends the C1 junction and its flexion at C7, so it's called flexion extension. And this position brings the tongue forward out of the way of our stroboscopy instrument. We're going to first apply hurricane spray on the base of the tongue. So having to open it nice and wide and keeping the tongue inside the mouth, which is actually critical, we're just going to have you relax the tongue and saying, ah, we're going to put some spray on the tongue in the back of the, the throat. Say, ah. I usually do two separate sprays. The first is on the back of the tongue, and then the second is on the uvula and the posterior pharyngeal wall. Second time. Ah. And as you can tell, this stuff stings and fizzes, and so it's a good idea to warn people that they're going to have a bit of a reaction to it. When I have this done on me, I cough and I choke and I cry tears, so it's, <laughs> it's not trivial to have the spray done. But it does help a lot, and although there are many people that can actually do this exam without the spray, I generally give the spray to everyone on the first time doing it so that we can have success. With any sort of laryngoscopy, actually, if you start gagging, it's very difficult to recover from that. So it makes a lot more sense to try to prevent gag reflex from happening in the first place with generous topical anesthesia. In order to get our scope focused, you have to decide about how far away you feel the larynx is going to be in terms of the height of your plane of focus. With rigid stroboscopy, the plane of focus is actually quite narrow which is to say if you're too close to the vocal cords it's out of focus and if you're too far away it's also out of focus. So there's a plane of focus that you're looking to try to get and it's usually a couple centimeters for the average person. So we're focusing right now you can see here probably about an inch or an inch and a half off of the lettering and we'll be able to adjust our focus as we go in and out in order to get the optimal image. In order to prevent the scope from fogging up, you can use one of two methods. You can either use anti-fog, which is something that you can drip directly on uh, the tip of the scope, or what I like to use, which is hot water. So what we do is we grab essentially hot water from our hot water dispenser. And if you warm up the tip of the scope, you can actually prevent the scope from fogging up from the warm breath of the, of, of the mouth. So the tip of the scope can be placed in the hot water just for about 10 seconds or so in order to let it warm up and not let it get too hot so you're not going to burn the patient's mouth. So this is our position now to have the scope warmed up, to have it focused, and to have the patient in the leaning forward sniffing position. It requires a lot of coaching for someone to get through their first time doing rigid stroboscopy. And so what I like to do is have people practice the position and practice that leaning forward sniffing position with the tongue all the way out of the mouth and I grab the tongue with the gauze with my forefinger on the top and my thumb on the bottom. Not too tight, it's not a struggling match or wrestling match between your tongue and the fingers because actually the tongue is much stronger than your grip or your ability to hold it. So what the fingers are doing is reminding people to keep their tongue out of their mouth. With the tongue out of the mouth we want you to say E. Okay, so we're going to have you lean forward, chin up, tongue all the way out, and let's give a practice. Go ahead, E. A. Good. So it's not going to sound like E with a tongue out. It sounds like uh, but you got to think E the whole time. So when you're getting positioned for rigid stroboscopy, the ergonomics are quite important, which is that you want the height of the patient chair to be in a position where it's comfortable for you standing up straight 
with your shoulders back and looking at the screen. You don't want to be hunched over. You don't want to, want to be in an uncomfortable position because you need to have your shoulders and your arms stable in order to be able to get a good quality image. So we warm up our scope. So with stroboscopy, it's an iterative process, which means you have to go in and out sometimes, multiple times, in order to get an exam that's appropriate brightness, that's appropriate focus, and that has the exam straight and centered in the viewfinder. So it's okay to go in and out. If your exam is not focused, come back out, change the focus. If the exam is too bright, come back out, lower the brightness, and go back in again. Each time, you have to use the hot water to warm up the tip of the scope and have the patient in that same sniffing position, leaning forward, chin out, and relaxing the jaw and relaxing the tongue. So leaning forward, tongue all the way out. I've got your tongue for you. So a nice deep breath and say, E. So we go in and then turning the scope around the tongue, we find the vocal cords. Now the first time you go in, you're going to end up seeing likely the base of the tongue and the epiglottis. What you can then do is just adjust each time when she's saying E. You go forward and shoulder up. You take a breath. Forward and shoulder up in order to get in focus. You can't move when the patient is taking a breath because if she's taking a breath, it's likely that she'll gag if you try to move. So you hold still when she takes a breath and then you can adjust your straightness, adjust your focus, and just a gentle clear. <coughs> and now just focusing on your breathing. Just focus on your breathing. Breath in. Good. Breath in. And what we're looking for here is to make sure you can see the blood vessels of the vocal cord very sharply in focus. And you can notice my position here was I'm standing straight up with my shoulders back and not hunched over at all. Good. And coming up. Very good. So you can see here that the goal is very small incremental movements with the scope in the mouth. I keep my fingers like this and the scope resting on it to provide a fulcrum so that you're actually making small movements forward, shoulders up, forward, shoulders up in order to get position. You're not just floating in the mouth because you don't want to be able to contact the teeth or the tongue or the, the posterior pharyngeal wall. And if you do that in an uncontrolled fashion with the scope floating around, you'll tend to make patients gag. So keeping a stable position with your shoulders back, looking at the screen, and just slow incremental movements with phonation, pausing and not moving when the patient's taking a breath. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the keys in order to get a good sharp image. And then to realize, of course, too, that the height of the larynx changes with the pitch. The larynx will rise with a high pitch, so you have to back up a little bit. Lower phonation, lower pitch phonation, the larynx will lower, so you follow it in and out based on the height of the larynx and the sharpness of the focus looking at the vessels on the vocal cord. So those are some of the tips and techniques that we have to get a good sharp image with a rigid stroboscope. All right, go ahead and lean forward, chin up, tongue out, as far as you can. I'm gonna grab hold of it here with the gauze. Okay, tongue out, as far as you can. Okay, go ahead and give me an E. Good, okay, exactly, turning your wrist so you turn the vocal cords. Give me another E. Good, and now shoulder up. Good, exactly. And breathe. Good. Good. And, and breathe. always do a little throat clear if you, <coughs> if you see some mucus on the vocal cords. And back to an E. Good. Go ahead and breathe for me. Give me a high E. Good, so you see how the larynx rises up towards it, so you have to change your focus a little bit. Now a low E. Good, and your scope will have to go in a little bit to, to follow the larynx down. Good, and breathe. Now glide from low to high. Good, and breathe. And then one last modal pitch. Now just focus on breathing. Good. Good. So you can see by moving your yeah. scope forward and tipping your shoulder up, you'll be able to get a nice view of the anterior commissure, which is important for 
full evaluation. Yeah. That's All good right. there. So now we're going to take a look at flexible strobolaryngoscopy, which is a different technique entirely and requires a whole different set of approaches in regards to anesthesia and patient positioning, as well as the patient tasks that you can do in terms of evaluation of vocal cord function and uh, vibration. Just like with rigid stroboscopy, though, really the critical factor in terms of patient comfort during an exam is making sure you have appropriate anesthesia in the nose, sometimes even in the oral cavity, or in order to prevent a gag reflex and get the best possible exam. So the first step that we always do is to decongest and anesthetize the nasal passages, which in this case we're going to do with oxymetazolam or afrin and then lidocaine spray. I typically put afrin spray in first in the nose, and what we're going to have to do is have the patient just sit in a comfortable position with the tissue in case there's any dripping of the spray from the nose. And we have a nice just mist here that we're going to apply just on a nice sniff in the nose. Okay. So a nice, nice big sniff in. And good. Do one more time. Nice sniff. Good. And we're holding the nozzle straight back. Of course, the nasal passages go straight backwards from the nose. And so that's the best way to apply the spray. So it goes straight back um, through the nasal cavity. Now, same thing with lidocaine. Nice sniff in. Good. And sniff in. Good. Those sprays in the nose are what's typically required for flexible laryngoscopy. However, for people who have a significant gag reflex, and in fact, if, if there's any part of the exam where you think you're going to want to get very close to the vocal cords, it helps to do a transoral spray of the mist as well, of the lidocaine. So what we have people do is leaning forward from the waist, chin up and out, just like we have in that same position for a rigid stroboscopy, and we have them breathe the mist in the mouth. So just on a slow inhale, in through the mouth, so tongue all the way out, good. And now a nice breath in, and exhale, good. One more time, breath in, good. That often makes people cough, because you're really getting the anesthesia right down to the vocal cords, but it facilitates a very good and careful examination of the vocal cord in a way that sometimes a transnasal spray doesn't facilitate. So this is our flexible laryngoscope. And I always hold the laryngoscope with my thumb controlling the movement of of the tip of the scope. And unlike a rigid stroboscopy or rigid um, stroboscope, you don't have to focus this. You can see, however, that there is barrel distortion in terms of the image. You can see how the text curves here, which is actually a design that's inherent to the fish eye effect of the uh, lens on the end of this camera. You can see how the lines of the text curve here as if they're wrapped around a globe. And that's one of the reasons why rigid stroboscopy gives a slightly more accurate anatomic image of the vocal cords themselves, but there are of course benefits to doing flexible laryngoscopy in terms of patient tolerance and the tasks that you can have people do. Just like rigid stroboscopy, you want to have the patient in a comfortable position, and, and they can be in that sitting forward sniffing position as well because that helps facilitate a view of the vocal cords. The ergonomics are important, you want to be standing uh, with your shoulders back and looking at the screen. Um, so that you're comfortable. The critical thing about controlling a flexible laryngoscope is actually to have a point of contact at the patient's nose and to have the scope be straight between your point of contact at the nose and your hand. If the scope is straight, when you rotate your wrists, you can see that the tip of the laryngoscope moves. If you have your wrist close together, so there's a curve or a bend in the laryngoscope, when you twist your wrists, nothing happens at the tip of the laryngoscope where you're trying to actually um, facilitate movement in order to change your view. So if you have a bend in your scope like this, nothing happens when you twist your wrist. If you have it straight, the whole view will change just by simply rotating your wrist. So what we do is we go straight into the nose for a view. The nose nasal passage is straight back. There are two ways that you can get through the nasal passage. The first is the low view, which is sort of the default view when you look into the nose. The inferior turbinate is to the top left here, the septum to our right, and the nasal passage simply just goes straight back along the floor of the nose, essentially sneaking underneath the inferior turbinate 
and getting to the nasopharynx right here in the back. The other way to get through the nasal passage, and in fact the one that I prefer for most patients because it's actually the way that air flows through the nose naturally, is to actually go above the inferior turbinate at the junction, this little triangle where we can see right here, where the inferior turbinate is below us, the middle turbinate is above right there, and the septum is to our right. This little triangle, this space right here, is actually usually the most comfortable position for the flexible scope to travel through the nose. So we travel through this here, and again, you can see I keep my hand anchored on the patient's nose with my fingers on the scope. We can have you say Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Kitty cat. Kitty cat. So that's velopharyngeal function. And now a nice sniff in the nose. With a nice sniff, you push forward and move the scope down. So again, with this scope in this position here, we can see what we're talking about in terms of the straightness of the, the scope between your two hands. If my scope is straight and I twist my wrists, the scope moves dramatically and I can change my view. If I bring my hands together so there's a, a loop or a bend in the scope, if I twist my wrists, I've totally lost control of the distal aspect of the scope and I can no longer control what I'm doing. So you keep your hands straight. The first evaluation from an oncologic point of view, of course, is always just to evaluate the anatomy. So we can look at the base of tongue by having you stick your tongue out. You can check both sides of the base of tongue. You can have your tongue back in. And then for mobility, we have E sniff. So it's alternating between E and sniff, like this. E. Good, back and forth. E. 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 You want a high or mm -hmm. just a regular? Yeah, just E and sniff again, back and e. forth. E. E. Good, so that's evaluating vocal cord mobility. Now, with a sustained modal E, just a straight E, you can usually move closer on the E and take a breath. You typically back up when they take a breath. And now try a higher pitched E. And move forward on the E and back up when they take a breath. Now a pitch glide, low to high. Good. And then I always end my exams by a careful and close inspection of the vocal cords. Mm -hmm. So chin up just a little bit, please. And now you can notice if I have the patient move their head, so turn your head to the right for me, please. I can actually sort of bring the larynx into a different position and just slowly breathing in and out through the nose. Don't swallow, don't speak. We just go slowly to the vocal cords that final evaluation of just the anatomy, looking at the edge of the vocal cords, we can actually see into the subglottis here. Good. And the spray that we did in the mouth at the beginning actually helps facilitate that careful close look. One of the other uh, benefits, we can straighten your head now. One of the other benefits of a flexible scope in the nose is that we can evaluate running speech. For example, for spasmodic dysphonia, um, or for muscle tension dysphonia, which sometimes is a little bit hard to evaluate just on a sustained E, which is all you can do with a rigid scope. So if we can help, we'll do the passages for um, spasmodic dysphonia here. We can have you count from 60 to 65. 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. Good. And now 80 to 85, please. 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85. The 80s are the adductor spasmodic dysphonia and the 60s are abductor. And we can see the difference in terms of the amount of uh, laryngeal closure with those two uh, evaluations. And then when you leave the nose, basically you just let your thumb relax. And so the scope's coming out just naturally. And that's how we perform a flexible video strobolaryngoscopic exam. Thank you for watching and we hope you found this informative. For more information about the GBMC Voice Center, please visit our website.